Paul realized it was not his wisdom, his education, or his determination that made him useful in God's sight. His education made him a legalist. His wisdom made him proud. And his determination made him a terrorist. But it was God's grace that made him a minister. His natural abilities were liabilities until God's grace touched him. This realization is one of the foundational ideas for leadership and ministry. God doesn't need me, but he has called me. We are often surprised by God's choices. He is never limited in what he does. He chooses children, teenagers, men, women, regardless of age, education, status, or position. God has used insects, a donkey, and the weather as his agents. Bible stories clearly show that God is not constrained by our expectations. Old Testament culture shows the importance of the eldest son, the one who inherits the wealth and preserves the family name and status in society. Yet, when God chooses someone to work through, he doesn't often choose the eldest. He chooses Abel over Cain, Isaac over Ishmael, Jacob over Esau, and David over his 11 brothers. God works outside our expectations and qualifications. The cultures of Bible times valued, loved, and respected those women who had many children, especially sons. A large family of this kind meant economic success, military advantage, and the prospect of the family name being carried on for many gen generations. Yet when God shows how he works through a woman... He chooses those who cannot have children. And he opens their wombs. These women were viewed as practically worthless, but God chooses them over the ones who are valued by the world. He chooses Sarah, Abram's wife, Rebecca, Isaac's wife, Samuel's mother, Hannah, and John's mother, Elizabeth. God's calling of a person is always an act of of grace, not of necessity. There was a seminary professor who regularly reminded his students in the theology class that the first thing they should do when they arose in the morning was to thank God they were not necessary. Now, after reminding them of this on several occasions, the students became bold enough to challenge the professor and asked, why are you telling us this? Look at us. We have dedicated our lives to the calling of the ministry. We stay up until midnight studying Greek and Hebrew. And then you come and tell us first thing in the morning when you get up, thank God you're not necessary. How can that be? The professor had their attention, and after a few seconds of silence, he said, If you think you are necessary to God, you don't understand grace. And if you don't understand grace, how are you going to preach the gospel? A very wise professor, wasn't he? Yes, God's calling is always an act of grace, never a necessity. Paul said that he had a ministry. This ministry was given to him by the grace of God. I, I think it is, in, it is interesting to me, because I suppose if I had been writing, I would have said, I have a job. Paul said, I have a ministry. There's a great difference between a ministry and a job. When I have a job, I see it in terms of how much income it brings. When I have a ministry, I see it in terms of how much joy it brings. 
When I have a job, I count the hours and the challenges. When I have a ministry, I count the blessings and the opportunities. When I have a job, I use my body and my mind. When I have a ministry, I use my heart, my body, and my mind. When I have a job, I think of what my work does for my career. When I have a ministry, I think of what my work does for others. So in this first secret of healthy thinking for leadership, Paul reminds us that he thinks often about his calling. Secondly, he talks about his commission. In Ephesians chapter 3, this chapter with five sentences with so many of them over 100 words, he says this in verse 8, To me, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. I want us to think for a brief moment about that expression, the unsearchable riches of Christ. What I think Paul means is that humans can never fully comprehend everything there is to know about Jesus. Our minds can never grasp the height, breadth, and depth of divinity. Elsewhere, Paul writes, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Is it not so with us when we try to think of heaven? Imprisoned as we are in our world of experience, we have almost no way of contemplating what resurrection life will be like. Even scripture strains to describe for us, it relies on the imagery of absence to describe heaven. No sickness, no sorrow, no death, and no crying. When the Bible attempts to open our minds to the glory of eternal life, the rallying point is that Jesus himself will be there with us. One can become lost in the imagination of the boundless possibilities that eternity presents. There's a favorite statement of mine from the pen of Ellen White where she writes about this incomprehensibility of God. She says, the Bible, perfect as it is in its simplicity, does not answer to the great ideas of God. For infinite ideas cannot be perfectly embodied in finite vehicles of thought. So what Paul means when he uses this phrase, the unsearchable riches of Christ, is that no matter how much we know about God, there will always be much more to learn. It is is as though a huge banquet has been prepared for us and we are only able to feed on the crumbs that fall from the edge of the table. You remember that Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Have we truly experienced the fullness of life that God intends for us to have? A very famous uh, (coughs) Christian writer who's now dead belonged to an evangelical church. And he wrote a critique about his church, which I think might apply to more than just uh, those in the evangelical umbrella of the church. This is what Dallard Willard said as a critique of his own church. He said, history has brought us to the point where the Christian message is thought to be essentially concerned with only how to deal with sin, with wrongdoing and wrong being and its effects. Life, our actual experience, is not included in what is now presented as the heart of the Christian message, or it is included only marginally. The current gospel then becomes a gospel of sin management. We need to be preaching the gospel in such a way 
that people become known for what the gospel affirms and our church becomes known for what it affirms rather than what it denies. What do our communities around our churches know about Seventh-day Adventists? We are often thought to be queer people with strange habits, people who do not know how to have fun. No smoking, no drinking, no gambling, no movies, no fun. What Paul is trying to say in this passage is that the news about Jesus Christ is good news. And when it gets into a person's heart and mind, it does amazing things. The unsearchable riches of Christ ought to make us the happiest people on earth, the healthiest people on the planet, the most enjoyable neighbors, the most peaceful society, and the most helpful to people in need. The gospel reframes our entire life, attitudes, appetites, beliefs, behaviors, commitments, habits, relationships, and values. Every basic human need, every motive, every life experience is reframed, reoriented, refreshed, and repurposed by the gospel. No wonder Paul says, it's it's my ministry to speak about the unsearchable richness of God. Besides forgiveness of our sins and assurance of eternal life, the gospel can heal fractured relationships and conflicts, can give a new perspective to suffering, can bring financial stability to one's spending habits, can provide the key to coping with debilitating disease, can furnish the power to free a person from evil habit, can bring relief from the crippling burden of guilt, inject meaning to an otherwise boring and unrewarding job. It can shine light into the darkness of a prison and recharacterize failure and defeat into wisdom and grace. It can do all that and much more. I fear at times that my church emphasis on truth results in shrinking rather than expanding our view of God. We are so anxious to pin down every little detail of truth with the expectation that soon we will have, actually I have it all, and I am going to tell it to you. And we even boast that we have more truth than others. What Paul wants us to understand is that when we bundle up everything we know about God, it is less than a drop in the ocean of all there is to know about him. We are commissioned to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ. What an awesome privilege. What a way to think about one's purpose. Thirdly, Paul talks in this chapter about his commitment, and he introduces us to this dimension of his life in a very, very unusual way. You you kind of have to come at it from the backside to understand what he's saying. You find it in verse 12 of chapter 3. He says, Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulation. Who of us would want to have lived his life? He provides a short summary in 2 Corinthians, remember, where he talks about his labors, the many times he was beaten with stripes, with rods. Once he was stoned, three times he was shipwrecked, a day and a night in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils. It's another one of those sentences that goes on forever. He cannot stop In spite of the hardships in life, Paul did not feel sorry for himself, nor did he want the sympathy of others. Instead, he saw himself on a mission for God and costs connected with that mission did not matter. Now, we all believe in commitment. Most of the time, we want to negotiate our commitments. 
We're very reluctant to give up our right to decide. We want to remain in the driver's seat for our lives. But when God calls us, he doesn't always give us all the details. He only asks for our trust. In other words, we simply cannot know in advance all the things that God will be asking of us. One of the subtle tools of the devil is to tempt God's servants to feel sorry for themselves, to compare their hardships with the ease experienced by others, to feel that somehow life is unfair to them, that the burdens they have are heavier than the burdens of others, that advantages and opportunities always go to other people and never to me. There's a great danger in this type of thinking, for when we begin to feel sorry for ourselves, we lose the capacity to be objective and to view our work in light of our calling and our commission. And therefore, this great apostle shared this third secret of his thinking. I don't feel sorry for hardship. The truth is, that every worthwhile task in life is accompanied by a discipline that hurts. To be a musician, an engineer, a statesman, a great teacher, a respected author, all of these require pain and hardship. There is no easy path. A life of faith does two things. Faith helps you see God behind everything that he uses. And faith keeps you in the place where you are not sure what will happen next. To have faith, you cannot always want to know what is happening or going to happen. God wants us to trust him alone from minute to minute. The strength he gives you in one minute is not intended to carry you through the next. Let God take care of his business. Just be faithful to what he asks of us. To depend upon God from moment to moment, especially when all is dark and uncertain, is a true dying to oneself. This process is so slow and inward that it is often hidden from ourselves as well as others. One writer reminds us, when God takes something away from you, you can be sure he knows how to replace it. Eat in peace what God gives you. Tomorrow will take care of itself. The one who feeds you today will surely feed you tomorrow. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Beware of the compulsion to measure success in human terms. God calls us to faithfulness. And he will be responsible for our fruitfulness. We need to remember that not all fruit in the garden ripens at the same time. The challenge from Paul is that we should not be focused on our hardships. Instead, we should simply do our best. On one occasion, Jesus spoke about the influence of one's life in these words. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What Jesus is saying is that if you want your life to be influential, the first thing is to make sure it is connected to the right source. Perhaps the principle that's most important for spiritual leaders is that when you guard your secret life with God, your public life will take care of itself. Jesus assures us that if we are connected to him, the visible effect of our lives, however small, will be a blessing to the world. He made several crucial observations about fruitfulness, a term that we often confuse with success But what Jesus says, we are called to be fruitful. We will be fruitful if we abide in him. Fruitfulness is seasonal, is not seasonal, it lasts. The effect of our labor will be permanent. 
This also suggests the permanence of our calling, not just a career, not dependent only on a remunerative job. So we must conclude. Brothers and sisters, as you face the challenges in your work, in your ministry, and your leadership, I urge you to think carefully about how you think. How you think about your life and your purpose and your role. And I trust that the testimony of the Apostle Paul will bring you courage and endurance. Remember your calling. By God's grace, you have been called to ministry. Your commission to preach the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ and your commitment to be in partnership with God is a blessing, not a burden, regardless of the cost. God bless you.